Hey, well, good evening, Grove family. So good to be with you today. Uh, whether you join us in person, online, or out in the courtyard, we really are excited to be worshiping with you this weekend. Uh, my name is David Reynolds, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here on staff. Before we get started, I have just a few announcements for you. The first one is that if this is your first time joining us, man, we really are excited that you are with us. Uh, one thing, if you wouldn't mind filling out the Connect card that you would, uh, should have received in the bulletin that you received when you walked in, Fill that out, drop it off at Guest Central or in the offering on your way out. What we'd love to do over the next couple of weeks is just get in touch with you, get to know you, and find ways to make the Grove home for you. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be awesome. Uh, a few other things going on all here inside of your bulletin. Uh, we have baptisms coming up in a couple of weeks. In fact, we'll have a talk on baptism right after service in the Guest Central area. And so if you're interested in that, ready to start the new year off with that, make sure to head over there. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, we have our Change Discipleship Journey Experience coming up and starting. It's a launch night. Uh, we actually have an information and registration table in the ministry hallway, which is the hallway behind the big worship center here. Uh, if you want to just more information or wondering what, what that entails, stop by there. We'll have some people answering questions and be even able to sign you up right there. A lot of other things going on as we kick off a new year, but that's all the announcements that we have at this time. Let's stand and let's get ready to worship the Lord together. How we doing, Grove family? Happy New Year to everybody. How we doing tonight? Is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord? Just one more time to give glory and praise and honor to a good, good, good Father. Hey, church, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about this new year. Can you even believe that it's 2024? Well, I can't. Okay. <laughs> but before we start our service, I thought it would be really awesome and nice for the first weekend of the year for us to start with reading a verse together. And I would love for you to join me. It's Psalms chapter 98, verses 1 through 8. So why don't you join in with me? Let's read together. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So let's make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of the melody. With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Verse 7. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills sing for joy together. Let the church say amen. amen. Hey, listen, if, if creation was built and made to worship heaven and worship God, then it is our responsibility and it is our honor to worship and to lift up our voices, to clap our hands, to lift our hands, to open up our mouth and to lift up our praises to Lord. So before we start this service, can we just take a moment to lift up our worship to God? Why don't we take a moment to think about how he's been good and how he's been faithful to us in 2023 and how we believe that he's going to be faithful in 2024. Amen, church. So for a moment, I'm just going to ask you, why don't you lift your hands all over the room as a sign of surrender unto our God. And why don't we just take a moment to think about his faithfulness. God, we thank you for being so faithful. You were faithful in 2023, and we believe you'll be faithful in 2024. Goodness of God, you are so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will see of the goodness of God. Come on, help me lift that all over the room. See all my life you have. All my life you have been faithful. He was faithful last year and he's faithful even now. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. With every breath that I am made. Oh, I will see of the goodness of, the goodness of God. So
one more time, church. Let's lift it up. All my life.
song so much. It's like so pumped. pumped like, yeah. But sometimes the truth is we're really not feeling that way. And I know going into a new year, it can be hard to really trust the direction that God has you and your family planned in. But we just want to sing over you and to encourage you wherever you may be at, that you can trust his will, you can trust his plans for your life. Amen, church? All right, y'all. I'm out of breath, and so y'all got to sing this with me. <laughs> God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, cause you're where my help comes from. time to say Hallelujah, our God surely does reign. God, we thank you for 
just reigning over all of our lives and being so consistent in all of our lives. First weekend of the year, we can attest for your faithfulness and we can attest for your goodness and that you still do reign on the throne. So as our service continues to go forward, God, I pray that you would just continue to do the work that you've already begun in the lives and the hearts of your people. It's in your precious son, Jesus' name we pray that all God's people say amen. Say amen one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, before you take your seats, why don't you turn to your right, to your left, your front, back. Greet somebody tonight. Tell them, hey, how you doing? It's so good to see you. I don't know how many of you know uh, sad news that Kendall Brown, our pastor of sports, and Gina Brown, our uh, chaplain for the Grove, they, well, Kendall retired on the 31st of December. Gina's going to hang with us until about April. And uh, I just want to say thank you for the, to them uh, for the years they, they put in a service here. Uh, Kendall, I can remember 21 years ago, I can remember the hole that we're playing golf on and the course when I asked you to be the pastor of sports when there weren't any pastor of sports and uh, sports ministry weren't in many, many churches. Uh, I thought if I asked you to uh, join the staff, you'd let me win that day, but you didn't. So, but I hired you anyway. <laughs> so I'm thankful for you, Kendall. I remember when I told you that I, I just want, I know you can do a great job doing that. I, I realize that I believe that as we built this campus, that sports could be uh, great for our church and for our community. But not only that, that uh, sports could bring people to church. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You can do it. I know you can do it great. And I, I would say that what you've done the past 17 years of being pastor of sports, well, I, I, I could never dream it. Uh, it's beyond what I thought would ever happen here. And I'm going to say when things happen like that, I realize that it's a God-sized dream. And you, you did it well. Many times people said when you introduce yourself, we're out together, I'm the pastor of sports. They said, well, I'd like to have that job. I think I told him every time, you couldn't do his job. Uh, <laughs> it's a hard it's job, true. and you did it great. And I'm thankful for you, Kendall. I really am. Yeah. Uh, I think God created you to be the pastor of sports here, just like he created Gina to be our chaplain. Gina, when you call people and talk with them and pray with them and go to the hospital and take them dinners and all the things you do, man, you just bring joy wherever you go. But the two of you together have been a, a blessing to me. I've never had to tell you anything in my ministry. Just do what you do. And uh, uh, we've never had a disagreement about anything. It's been, it's been amazing. And so when you go to Crossville, Tennessee, I know that church is getting one of the greatest couples I know when they get you to. So I, I'm very thankful for you and what you've done for the Grove and our incredible ministry of sports. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Awesome. I wanted, wanted Tom up here to... Uh, really initiate the goodbye because they're they're like best friends. Tom hired him. Um, Kendall's just a very special person. I've gotten to know him over the years, and I've worked here for over 20 years. If you know Kendall, he's very old school, uh, very direct. Uh, he his Excel sheets are old school. Uh, he did clip art for the longest times. I'm like Kendall, you have to use our graphic designer. He's like Daniel, nobody cares. They do care. <laughs> He's one of the best athletes that I've ever just hung out with. I mean, we have battles of ping pong. I've never beat him in golf. Never. I beat Tom three times in 18 years. I beat, never beat Kendall. It just shows what a poor golfer I am, I guess. <laughs> I'll say this about Kendall, though. Even though he's direct and old school, he has the softest heart for this community. And he's wanted people to come to know Jesus through our sports ministry. And he'd come to me at times with tears in his eyes and say, Daniel, we, we have a family that was in sports, and now they're here at the church, and this is why we do what we're doing. And the other thing I love about you, Kendall, I love watching you worship. You'll see him down here. Man, you want to see a man's man? He's a man's man. His, his hands are raised with tears in his eyes, worshiping the God that he serves. Uh, you've encouraged and sharpened me in how you worship. And the wife that you have, the gentleness of her heart, Gina. Gina helps care for people in our, our church family uh, who are in the hospital, um, who are stuck at home because of illness. She goes and sees them, makes them feel loved. Uh, you are 
you are a blessing, and we love you guys, and you deserve to be honored. So these are for you. And Tom has a gift for you as well. Love you, brother. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say it's been an incredible 17 years as a sports pastor in that role. Um, it's, it blows me away that God chooses to use sports to bring people to him. Um, it's amazing. So it's been an incredible privilege uh, building the foundation for the sports ministry here at the church. I know it's going to be an incredible journey uh, from here on uh, with Jeff Kudo, who's going to be taking over, and I know he's going to do a fantastic job. And uh, so it's just fun being, being a, it was a privilege being able to be part of the foundation of, of the sports program. Uh, but I'm excited to see where the sports program is going to go from here uh, in the next chapter uh, of this church. So uh, it's been a blessing, and uh, thank you for your support. Uh, I'm not going to miss your emails asking for certain days for practice, uh, but there will be some other parts uh, that I will miss. Are, but, you, uh, are you talking to me or them? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. Love you guys. I love you, Gina. I love you guys. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Thankful that you can join us on the first uh, first weekend of the new year. I know some of you come with high expectations for what this year has for you. I know some of you come with extremely broken hearts uh, with where you're at. Uh, I look at my brother Dave Gladura uh, right here in the second row. His daughter Rebecca. They just uh, you just lost your wife yesterday, uh, Nancy. Uh, who they've been long. How long have you been coming to this church for, Dave? Thirty eight years and. Uh, you served your wife so well. Uh, you really did. Um, God's brought her home, even though we prayed for something different. Bumped into Dave last night at, at Islands, and a family from our church was taking you out. And he said, Daniel, I haven't been in church in five weeks. I can't wait to worship with my girl family tomorrow. Um, and we're thankful that you're here. And many others of you uh, here just worshiping the Lord, needing the Lord. Uh, we need him. Can't go through this life uh, without him. Um, so let me just open this time with, uh, committing our, our lives to the Lord and all that we do to him. Father, we come before you, some with hearts just filled with joy and excitement for the year to come, and some whose hearts are filled with sorrow and, and barely made it here today. And we need you, Lord. We can't do anything without you. Uh, as we do our best to study your word, may your spirit speak to us in ways that only your Holy Spirit can. May you guide us and direct us, and may we live for your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. With the new year upon us, I'm a big goals guy. I made a lot of goals. Uh, I like them. Uh, we have goals for our church as well. Goals to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we preach through the book of Philippians. We have keychains for you outside as you uh, leave today if you haven't grabbed them already. We had a couple thousand more keychains come in. We passed them out last weekend. Um, so it says walk worthy on it or drive worthy or whatever you want to do. <laughs> uh, we also have goals to, to help disciple our people all the more as we launch our discipleship a book called Changed, and hope that you'll be a part of that. You can sign up for that once again outside uh, the doors as you leave. If you don't like to sign up online, uh, go to the table. We'll help you sign up today. We also have goals to help you come to service on time. Why not? Goals for the New Year's. Uh, so I want to challenge you, uh, and, and really this is also for, for, for Sunday morning, not only goals to get you to church on time, but, but, but goals to, to get you out on time as well picking up your kids and those types of things. How are we going to do this, specifically on Sundays? I'm thankful for this group that comes to Saturdays. But on Sundays, what we've done is we're, we've actually hired Riverside Police Department uh, to be on Trout Wine to help with traffic every single weekend now. You can clap for that if you want. Yeah. Uh, it's not cheap, I'll tell you that, not cheap. Something we typically only do on Easter, but because of uh, our attendance and how it's been growing, those lines are long and uh, trying to make things more convenient for our church family in coming to church, but also in leaving. I think a good goal for all of us to have, I've heard Tom say this, have the goal to come to church and be in your seat five minutes before service starts. I see some of you smiling like, it's impossible. It's not impossible. You can do it. <laughs> to have your kids, to have your kids checked in, to sit and say hello to the people that are next to you in the sections. We all sit pretty much in the exact same spots. Uh, to, to just get your heart ready to worship, uh, not to come frantic, but to be ready, I think that's a, that's a good goal for, for us to have. If you occasionally come on Sunday mornings, I hope you'll stay in the service. But if you do, I mean, the, the police will help people get here quicker. 
Um, they're not going to help me end my service quicker. <laughs> That's on me. <laughs> um, another thing I also want to challenge our church with is I, I want to challenge you not to leave right when I'm done preaching. Um, but stay during that last lost song. Uh, so many times people just want to get out real quick. That last song is a time just to respond and worship to the Lord. And I say this as kindly as I can. It can be distracting when people are leaving and others are trying to worship. So I want to encourage you. I'm saying this as a friend. Don't think I'm picking on you. I'm saying this as a, as a friend to, to encourage you. Other things, uh, make sure your cell phone's off as you come to church. With more people, we've been having more cell phones go off. Have you realized that? Um, so just make sure, remind your friend, your roommate, your spouse, hey, is your cell phone off? Do that. That would, that would be great. Something else, kids. Kids in service, babies in service. You know that they're welcomed here? Do you know that not every church actually allows babies to be in their service? We do. Um, so they are allowed, but if at any point in time they start getting loud or they start getting a little antsy, all we ask is that you would, is that you would leave and that you would go, <laughs> hear me out. I'll work on the presentation better for tomorrow. <laughs> that you would go to one of these glass rooms right here. These people in the glass rooms, we're all looking at you. They're not on timeout. This is not a, this is not a penalty box. They were not in trouble last weekend and they're in there this weekend. Uh, this church was designed for young families to bring their kids there and still be a part. Some churches actually have a completely different room. They're not a part. You can still be a part over there. Does it feel a little weird at times, guys? Occasionally. But you put in your time. You had decided to have a kid. We're glad that you did. Um, so there comes a point where it's like, okay, the, the kid's not being quiet. Time, time to go. Natalie spent many, many sermons walking the hallways, uh, watching on the screen there. We have TVs everywhere around here in the hub. So there's a lot of places. So yes, kids are welcomed, but if they're noisy, please look after everybody else in trying to pay attention and, 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 and walk outside <laughs> and watch somewhere else. Did that come out okay? <laughs> you think like, yes, yes, no. I think it was okay. So Todd was like, eh. <laughs> we'll work on it for better tomorrow, okay? We love, we love you. We hope these things will only improve our services. And I'll say this a couple times a year now, just reminding us of these things. Today, I'm very excited to teach you the book of Philippians. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there right now. Uh, as we mentioned in October, November, the book of Philippians is a thank you letter uh, that Paul wrote to the church of Philippi for the generous gift that they gave to him. Thank you for your donation. So much more than just a thank you letter for a financial gift. Uh, it is a letter of encouragement to a church that he, that he loves. It is a letter of encouragement and love to a very, very mature church. In fact, I tell you, it reminds me of the Grove. The Church of Philippi reminds me of the Grove. I believe this. I'm not just saying this because I'm the lead pastor here. I believe we have a very mature church. I think there's those of us, myself included, that continue, we need to mature, as we saw in my announcements, you know, and just in life. <laughs> but Church of Philippi was very mature. It was the, a church, I think, very close to Paul's heart. It was the first church that he planted in Europe that the Lord led him to plant. Paul is, is, is charging this church to keep the gospel center of everything that they do, because it's so easy for us to get distracted in life. Uh, the book talks a lot about joy, it talks a lot about content, contentment, it talks a lot about unity, uh, but it's not about those things. It's about being focused and centered in the gospel. And that when your life is centered in the gospel, wouldn't you know you have more joy? Wouldn't you know it's easy for us to be unified as a church because we're centered on the gospel? It's easy for us to be content in life because God has given us everything that we need. So it's a life being centered around the truth that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins and rose again. In fact, in this letter, uh, the word gospel is mentioned more than any other letter that Paul writes. It's constantly talking about the gospel. Our theme verse for this year, Philippians 1.27, says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that live worthy is where we get to walk worthy, not just our life, but every step. So that Paul's saying, whether I come to you and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith, for the faith of the gospel. Paul's not with this church. If you weren't with us when we started talking about the introduction in the fall, Paul's in prison, he's writing to the church that he loves, saying, live worthy, live worthy of the gospel, live worthy of what has saved you, what Jesus 
has done in your life. And that's his hope for the church that he loves. And that's, that's our hope for each and every single one of you here at the Grove. The book of Philippians is short. It's only four chapters long. It's 104 verses. If you're looking at it in your Bible, it takes up three full pages in my Bible. But it's loaded, loaded, loaded with truth and encouragement. We have the whole book outlined. Uh, we're going to be preaching this through May. Uh, 20, about 20 weeks or so. And very excited to spend time in this, in this with you. Because this is one of the most popular books in the Bible. And today we start with the introduction. Philippians 1, 1 through 2. The intro is short, but it's packed with information that's good for us to study. So for that purpose, we're going to spend two weeks on these two verses. We're going to spend one week on verse 1, and then the next week on verse 2. It's only going to be 20 weeks, I promise. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow. <laughs> sure, it's not going to be 104 weeks long, two years. It could be, but we're not going to do that. We're also going to be looking at the Church of Philippi's beginning, how the church began. I briefly hit on this. Uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, is where we get the information and details of how the church of Philippi started. It started 10 years earlier from when this letter was written. So we'll be looking at verse 1 today in the first half of Acts 16, and then verse 2 next week with the second half of Acts 16. So you might want to start reading Acts 16 to become more familiar with this book. If we're going to appreciate what Paul wrote to this church, I think we also have to appreciate how it started. So let's start with Philippians 1, 1 through 2. Philippians 1, 1 through 2, and this was written by Paul. In the very beginning, it's his introduction. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul starts off by identifying this letter who is being sent by. It's being sent by him. It's also being sent by his counterpart, Timothy. In fact, six of the, Paul's letters uh, named Timothy as a co-sender. Him and Timothy had a close relationship. Uh, Timothy was his teammate. It was his younger teammate. It was the one that he was pouring into and teaching and bringing along. Picture Tom like Paul. Picture me like Timothy. Picture Tom bringing me along, along the way by, by his side as I uh, watched him lead and then tried my best to follow in his footsteps. That's the type of relationship that Paul and Timothy had. Now, the church of Philippi would have known Timothy. They would have loved Timothy. Why? Timothy was there when the church began, 10 years earlier. I mean, Timothy was there. We actually see how Paul and Timothy met right before the church was started. Where? In Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Turn to Acts 16. You may want to get bookmarks in both Philippians 1 and Acts 16. We're going to go back and forth, back and forth. Put both your fingers there. Acts 16, 1 through 5, how they met. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers of Lystra and Iconium. He, this guy had a good reputation. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. A couple observations here. Paul didn't do ministry alone. He never did ministry alone. When you think about doing ministry for the Lord, ministry is not ever supposed to be done alone. You look at Jesus and he came to this earth. He had a, he had a team. He had the disciples. He was bringing people along with him. Even start thinking about your life right now, who you're doing ministry with. You're not doing it by yourself, are you? Paul did it with others. In fact, if you were to read the end of Acts 15, that's where you see the conflict that Paul has with Barnabas. I mean, these guys were brothers serving the Lord together, and then they had a conflict on who was going to go with them on their next missionary journey, a guy named John Mark. That didn't, Paul didn't want him to go, so they separated. But even when Paul separated, he didn't go off by himself. He went with Silas. So him and Silas are now going to strengthen and encourage churches, and, and then they meet Timothy. 
Paul likes what he hears about Timothy and says, I want you to come and I, I want you to come and accompany us. It just shows us the importance of someone's reputation. When I read Proverbs, it says someone's name is better than gold or silver. The name that you have, the reputation that you have is better than money. It's not worth it to make an extra buck and lose the reputation that you have. Something else Tom taught me, he says, you build your reputation every single day by the people that you care for, the people that you love, how you interact with them. Every single conversation matters. What type of reputation that do you have? Timothy had a good one. It was so good. Paul says, I want you to come with me. I want you to accompany me. What an awesome picture of discipleship. You know, we're launching our changed book, and yet discipleship is not a book. It's a launching pad that will help us understand what it looks like to follow Jesus, but discipleship really is asking people to come along. Hey, come with me as I serve the Lord. Discipleship is not just going through a book. Hey, come with me and go through this book. No, discipleship is come with me as I serve the Lord, as I go care for this person who's hurting. Come with me. Think about that this coming year. Who can you ask to accompany you as you serve the Lord? Sometimes we're just waiting for someone else to invite us. Well, no one asked me. Who's going to ask me to come with them? Well, who are you going to ask to go with you? Who can you ask to serve the Lord? Because that is the model that Paul gives us. That's the model that Jesus has. Jesus is telling people, come and follow me. Come with me. Come with me. And what does Jesus do? He just goes and serves people. As he's serving people, they're watching. As they're watching, they learn. And they learn how to care and bring the gospel to those who need it. As we think about our plans for 2024, we need to consider who we should bring along with us to serve the Lord. So a couple application questions. Who do you need to ask to accompany you this year in serving Jesus? I'm always trying to think of two to three people that I can be pouring into myself in my own life. Not just the masses that come here, but okay, God, who do you want me to bring along and help point to you? Who do you need to join in serving serve? Join in serving Jesus. You're not doing that alone, are you? We're not meant to serve the Lord alone. Walking worthy of the gospel. As we talk about walking worthy, it's never done by yourself. It's done with teams, groups of people. Not just, oh, I go to the grove, but I do nothing else with the grove. I'm just by myself. Join a small group. Join a change group. Get connected. Look at our core value. Our fourth core value is teamwork. We're better together. We truly are. Why? Because we fill in the gaps. No one can do it by themselves. I'm the lead pastor of this church, but I don't make all the decisions here. I can't do it on my own. Why? Because I have so many weaknesses. I have so many blind spots. There's an elder board. I have a leadership team. We're constantly working on things together and outlining the sermon. I had a group of seven people helping break down Philippians. Why? Because I know the limitations of my giftings. And I know in a team we're better together. You're better with other people. And changed Having a change group, man, that may be the group that you help finally get connected and meet other people as you walk together to serve the Lord. Point number one on your notes, plan to walk worthy with others in serving the Lord. Don't do this by yourself. Don't isolate yourself. Serve the Lord with other people. Paul had worthy plans, worthy plans. And we're going to be talking about making worthy plans. I love making plans. Plans, woo, goals. I got like 40 for this year. You think I'm joking. I think I have 40 goals this year. <laughs> I, really, I got a lot of them. Make a worthy plan. Paul had one, a worthy plan of strengthening churches, planning churches, but he knew that he needed the right team. You're going to have the right plan. You need to have the right people with you, not just to help you accomplish what you want, but to pour into others. Going back to Philippians 1.1, Paul introduces himself in the letter. Paul and Timothy, after he says who they are, he says, servants of Christ Jesus. Some commentaries look at that Greek word where in the ESV it says servants. They say servants isn't even a strong enough word. They say it should be slaves. Paul is saying, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. That's who we are. It is interesting looking at how Paul introduces himself in the variety of letters that he writes. They're not all the same. They're similar. The number one title that he gives himself most of the time is apostle. Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus. I love that one. Why? Why would he say that? I think many times because he had to show that he had authority to speak truth. He's talking to the church of Galatia, a lot of issues. Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus, I have the authority to speak words of truth here. Interesting, as he talks to the church of Philippi, he doesn't use the title apostle of Christ Jesus. Why? I think this church had a very high view of him. They loved Paul and Timothy. 
This church is 10 years old. They knew the authority that they had. They may have even had too high of a view of Paul and his leadership. So Paul talks to the church that he loves and says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ, slaves of Christ. That's the view I want you to have of me. I'm nothing important. I'm nothing big. I'm not the leader of this church. I'm a servant of Christ. I'm a slave of Christ. Slavery was common during this time and in this location. People knew slaves were owned by their masters and completely under their master's control. So Paul is saying, we're slaves of Christ. We're completely under the control of Jesus. And this title is not daunting, like, oh my goodness, no. Paul says this in a way of like, this is a privilege. I am a servant of Christ Jesus. I am a slave of Christ Jesus. When you start to look at all the heroes of our faith in the Old Testament, when you start looking at people like Abraham and Moses and David, you know how they're described to us? Servants of Christ. Slaves of the Lord. That's who they are. Our world is filled with titles, is it not? Mom, dad, judge, pastor, lawyer, professor, CEO, CPA. Paul could have walked around being like, Paul in the house, apostle of Christ. And yet he said, Paul in the house, I'm a slave of Christ. Oh, that people would know that we're servants of Christ. Oh, that people that you work with would know that you are a slave of Christ, and that you are owned by him. That is the greatest privilege and title that you bear, that you serve the Lord with everything that's inside of you. Point one again, plan to walk worthy with others in serving the Lord. We're walking worthy with other people as we serve the Lord together, to serve Christ together as a team that together we would all see God as our master as we help one another serve the Lord faithfully, that this would be one of the the greatest jobs of our lives in all that we do. The second part of Philippians 1.1 says, who the letter's to. He starts off by saying who's who's it's from, then it's who it's to. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Who are the saints? Is it the people who performed a miracle? No. Saints are those that have been set apart for the Lord, those who've been made holy by the Lord. It's the church. Paul is writing this letter to the saints of Philippi, to the church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've given your life to the Lord, and you're in this room right now, you are a saint. You've been set apart. You are holy to the Lord. So take note of this. I think this is a great thing for all of us to take note to. Paul's not writing this to the leadership of the church. He's not saying, hey, elders and deacons, I'm saying this to you first. He puts the church first. Why? Because the church is only as healthy as the people in the church. Leadership's important, and leadership can do so much to make sure that there's health and how they preach the word of God, how they serve other people, but it takes all of us. So even as we read God's word, God's word is not being addressed to like these spiritual leaders, the the, the, the word of God's not being, well, Daniel, you better read this and make sure we're doing all right. No, as we read this, it's being addressed to you, to me, together. The other part I like, it's not just to all the saints of Philippi, but it's acknowledging leadership with the overseers, with the deacons. Why? It's showing that the church had leadership. It's showing that the church had organizational structure. Some people are just like anti-leadership. I don't need the church. Don't need leadership. I go to the coffee shop. I read the Bible with a buddy of mine. We do church. That's not church. That's you reading the Bible with your buddy. God has formed the church with leadership. We see this in the very, very beginning. It's there for a purpose. But here's the thing. I'm no better than you are. I'm a part of the church. I'm just one part. We all play a part. And we serve the Lord humbly together. Who am I? I'm a slave of Christ with you. As we serve the Lord together to be faithful in all things, that is our heart. That is our hope of what we're called to do. You know, as Paul wrote this letter, and he's addressing it to all the saints in Philippi, I have to wonder, did he have a tear in his eyes as he wrote that? To all the saints in Philippi, to think about the fact that 10 years prior, there were no saints in Philippi. Now he's writing to all the saints in Philippi, people whose lives have been changed. This church is growing. 
They're giving so that more people can be reached. I mean, even just reading that, God was doing a work in this church. When we read Acts chapter 16, and we'll do this in two parts this week and next week, you're going to see some of the saints of the church and how God changed their life. Some of the exact people that he was writing to 10 years later. Now, we can see how the church began. I, I kind of briefly talked about this in the fall, but let's look at Acts 16, 6 through 10, because here's the thing with, with the church of Philippi. The church of Philippi was not Paul's idea. It was God's idea. It wasn't his plan. It was never a plan of Paul to plant a church in Philippi. He had ideas somewhere else. And this is talking about making worthy plans in our lives. Sometimes our plans don't work out. It says, and they went through the region of Phrygia. Who, who's they? Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Galatia. And having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, that's a very interesting verse. And when they had come to Messiah, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. That's another interesting verse. So passing by Messiah, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging them and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And Luke was with them also, didn't say that. It's good to know this, the, the vision of Mas, the man from Macedonia saying, come over to us, preach the gospel to us. Macedonia is a region, uh, the, the city of Philippi was in the region of Macedonia. So they received this vision to go really there. I think this passage is fascinating, especially as we think about making plans for our life, worthy plans. I think as we think about 2024, hopefully we're thinking about, Lord, what do you want me to do for you this coming year? I want to plan. I want to have some goals. I want to do things for you. I hope that's at least on our mind just a little bit. But here's the thing that we have to also keep in mind. Our plans don't always work out. Any of your plans not work out in life? <laughs> I put two hands up. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't always work out. But I still love making plans. You have to keep this in the back of our minds. God's job is not to make your plans come true. God's job is not to make your plans come true. We can't just expect God to bless what we want to happen in 2024 because we may be going after something that he doesn't even want us to go after. And even the things that we're going after in our minds, it may be a good thing. We're making these plans. I want to honor you. I want to bring you glory. But that doesn't mean that that's what God wants in your life. He could be forbidding something that you want to happen. He could be forbidding something that you're planning on, ha on happening. And like I said, it could be a good thing that you're planning that you want to bring him glory. I think we can safely assume in this passage, I don't think I'm reading into the text, but I think we can safely assume that Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, that they had plans to go to Asia to speak about Jesus, yet the Holy Spirit forbid them to go and speak the word in Asia. Why would God forbid them to go somewhere that they weren't planning on doing? We don't see them say, like, I forbid you not to eat cats. I forbid you. We weren't even going to eat cats. Why would you forbid us to do such a thing? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Here in this passage, he's saying, I forbid you to go there. Why? Well, I think they had a plan to go to Asia. I think they had a plan to go there and bring the gospel there. Why in the world would God forbid them to go and bring the gospel to Asia? I don't know. I guess it wasn't time yet. The church was expanding. Maybe some people's hearts just weren't ready to receive it. What we do know is, even though it may have been a good plan, God didn't want that to happen at that point in time. Once again, our job is not to force God's hand to happen and make our plans work. Our goal is to be in step with him. So as we think about making plans, however great our plan we think that is, that we have constructed in our minds, it may not be what God wants. We have to constantly come before him and say, Lord, am I doing what you want? Lord, am I in step with you? And here's the thing. So I think they went and tried to go to Mycenae, or not Mycenae, to Asia. God forbids it. Then in Acts 16, 7, it says, and then it says, and when they had come to Mycenae, they had tempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So the second time now. So at some point on their journey, 
they made plans to go to Bithynia to tell people about Jesus. I would say this again, a very worthy plan. It took effort, it took energy, it took steps, it took time, more than likely it took money, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. Jesus kept it from happening. And we don't know, we don't know how the spirit of Jesus kept it from happening. He just closed that door. We know God closed that door. Uh, I want to say this, always be curious when God closes a door. When something that you like, this should happen, this should happen, and yet God's like, stop. I don't want this to happen. I have something else for you to do. God stops things many times, and many times when he stops something, that's, that's an answer from him. When he stops something, is that always like, it's stopping. It didn't work out right now, I'm going to stop. No. I mean, this is where you have to test. I'm going to say this carefully, like test like the Lord and, and what he's doing. Not like put him to the test, like, Lord, is this what you want? Do I keep on trying? Do I keep on going? When I wanted to be a landscape architect, I applied to Cal Poly San Francisco, I didn't get in. I worked at Louie's Nursery for some time with Juanita, loved it, down the street on Van Buren. I was trying to learn the plant names. So hard to know the plant names. They have two different names. So confusing. Went to Cal Poly Pomona, meeting with people there, meeting architects. I mean, I was trying, trying, trying. Closed door, closed door, closed door, closed door. After a while, I was like, I don't think I'm supposed to be a landscape architect. I keep trying. But those times were like, God wanted something to happen. It was just like, okay, a door open. And if anything, I was like, there's a little bit of resistance on my heart. It took some time. Resistance. Door open. Do I have... Tr- faith to keep on going. It was, it was very interesting trying to figure out where God was leading. But many times a closing door is an answer to walk in another direction. You may have been planning to do something for good, made attempts to bring God glory, the right steps, you put time into it, and God said, nope, not for you. That's a closed door. Well, I don't like that. Okay. Were your efforts and time pointless? No. God may have taught you lessons along the way. And in that that closed door, God showed you an answer of what's next. Can that be emotional in your life when God says no? Oh, yes, it can. A lot of tears. Can the journey be filled with disappointment? Yes. Oh, yes, it can. But when God says no to something, it's a great time to reevaluate your heart and try to think, okay, well, what do I want in my life? Do I want God to bless my plans? Or do I want to be a part of his plan? Because if you're just wanting God to do everything that you want, well, then aren't you God? Aren't I God? Who's the servant here? Is God serving you? Or are you serving God? So expect God to say no in your life at different points in time. And then in those moments of despair, in those moments of heartache, in those moments of now what? Get on your knees and pray like you've never prayed before. And say, Lord, even though this is what I want. What do you want, Lord? What do you want? And I will follow you. Am I living to serve God or hoping he serves me? Now, it's not wrong to make plans in life. Don't take away from this. Make plans. I know I'm type A. It's easy for me to say that. But I think scripture, the principles there, Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. What, what does that mean? I mean, I think there's a principle, biblical principle here. Better to make plans than just move quickly. You see that throughout Scripture. Tons of plans are there. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Talk to people. What do you think about this? What's going on? What should we do? Whatever it is that you're doing, make sure you're getting advice. Help with our plans. At the same time, keep in mind that the perfect constructed human plan put together by godly people may not be what God wants for you. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the purpose of the Lord that prevails. My favorite verse, Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. My buddy in the back, Kyle, jokes and says, you put that verse in there at least once a sermon. Usually I do, because I have to remind myself of this. So many plans. Lord, I'm making these plans for you, but you establish my steps. If I'm going to walk worthy, i got to allow you to establish my steps. I can't just be focused on what I want, one location, one thing. I'm constantly coming to a point of saying, Lord, are you going to redirect me in my life? What is it that you want? So we're constantly bringing to the Lord whatever we're doing, saying, is this what you want? Is this what you want? We're taking our plans to the Lord, saying, God, do what you want. I mean, Proverbs 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he'll establish your plans. He'll he'll make things happen the way that he wants. Wants. We just have to be willing to change directions at any 
point in time. Why? Because we live for him and not ourselves. We live for him and not ourselves. Truth is, many times we find out what God wants by him saying no to something. If there's something that I want to do and it doesn't work out, many times it's of God. I already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Paul had a plan to strengthen the church, start a church in Bithynia. It was a worthy plan. The Spirit of God kept him from doing it. The Spirit of God was going to lead Paul down a path that he had not considered. It was going to take a vision, a man from Macedonia saying, come, come this way to Philippi. I hope that we'll see together, because this is just as much for me as for you, that God uses a combination of our plans and the Spirit's leading to get us to where he wants us to go for his purposes. It takes both. Paul had a plan to strengthen and encourage the church, to plant churches. He was just going to the wrong places. And the Spirit intervened with his plans and brought him to the right place of where he needed to go so that people could be saved. Point number two in your notes. Plan to attempt great things for Jesus in 2024, but allow the Spirit of Jesus to redirect. And I think that's part of it. I think some people get handicapped by failure, and they just don't ever make attempts. Well, it may not work out. You're right, it may not work out. It didn't work out for Paul. But part of discerning the will of God is making attempts. Okay, I'm going to try to go to Asia. Nope, don't go there. I'm going to try to go to Bithynia. Nope, Spirit's going to stop you there. I'm sure there are a lot of emotional nights and moments in that time. In their minds, maybe at some point, time wasted. But you have to make attempts to see what God will say yes to and what he'll say no to. Don't just get stuck on what you want, but say, Lord, what is it that you want? Do you want to, here's a question, do you want to be where you want to be in 2024? Or do you want to be where God will lead you? Oh, Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And how can I have a heart that's ready to follow you? Let me ask you, do you think God's involved in the biggest details of your life? Yes. You know, like if you're going to get married, who you should marry, where you work, where you live. You know, how, how do we make plans and then allow the spirit to redirect? Uh, I think there's a, a, one illustration. I asked the Bartos' uh, permission to do this. Adrian Bartos and Phil, they're in the back here. Adrian oversees our hub. Uh, our food, our food uh, restaurant here. And Phil is a fireman. He's retiring. He's going to actually come on as our assistant director for sports ministry. It took two people to, t- to take on Kendall's job and really did. It's going to take more. Um, uh, so there you go. But they, they sold their house. They had a real nice, real nice house, more like a plantation. <laughs> and, uh, they sold it and they were looking for a house to buy. They, they found the house that they wanted. You know how buying a house can, it can be very emotional. They, they found the house um, and it came to the point where they owned the house. Con- contract wise. I don't know if I'm saying this the right way, but they, it was theirs. The family wrote them a letter and said, we made a mistake. We should not have sold. We know legally now it's yours, but can you please give it back to us? Now their house has already been sold. They're supposed to move in. And how long? Like a week? Two weeks away from them moving in. They have no place to go. And I even saw Adrian in the hub and her eyes were just watering. Like We don't know what to do. This is the house we want. We bought. Now this family is asking for it back. I mean, start thinking about what would you do in that situation? I told him, I said, I don't even know what to tell you. Seek the Lord and the Lord will lead you. I'm not putting any kind of pressure on you guys. (laughs) They sought the Lord and they thought the right thing to do was to give the house back to this family. They lived in a motor home uh, for for a couple months at my mother-in-law's house. Interesting enough, Kendall and Gina are living in a motor home at my mother-in-law's house. I'm like, this isn't a good look for the church. Uh, (laughs) All these people not living in homes, living in motorhomes at my mother-in-law's house. Like, come work for the Grove. Put you in an RV at my mother-in-law's house. <laughs> it's temporary. <laughs> but I think it's this moment they had a plan, very emotional for them. It's like God said enough to say, this is a closed door. They pulled back and reevaluated. God brought them another house, not the house they originally wanted, but they moved in. They're now out of my mother-in-law's land, just so you know. And as they were unloading, uh, they saw a woman walk by or some people walk by and Phil and said, hey, how you guys doing? We're the Bartos's. We just moved in. And Adrian's like, Phil, what are you doing? She's like, he's like, we're here for a reason, Adrian. We're here for someone here in this neighborhood needs to know Jesus. I'm, I am convinced of it. We're here for, and maybe it's them. And I was like, well, we think you just scared them away. (laughs) Maybe it's not them. But even, even that mindset right there, that's the exact mindset of Acts 16. 
we have a plan to go here. God closes the door. I'm going to bring you somewhere else. And now to have the mindset of who is it that the Lord wants me to help fulfill a purpose? Who's ready to receive the Lord? Those are the types of things. Now I ask you, is God involved in the biggest details of your life? You said, yes. Is he involved in the smallest details of your life? Is he involved in what parking spot you get? Do you ever thank the Lord for a parking spot? Thank you, Lord. I think, I say yes. I think if God, God is involved in the smallest details. He knows how many hairs are on your head. That's a very small detail. The other day, uh, I was, we've been sick. Anyone else sick? We've been sick for like two weeks. It's been, uh, not complaining, it's just what it is. And a, I mean, we, on Saturday after church, wasn't feeling great, so Natalie drove. Not, not too keen on that. Don't write me any emails if you're like, what's wrong with a woman driving? Nothing's wrong with a woman driving. I just, I usually drive. Um, so I'm not feeling good, Natalie drives. <laughs> I can rephrase this tomorrow. <laughs> so we're like, let's go to, let's go to Chick-fil-A. So we go to Chick-fil-A, and we're about to pull on the one on Day Street, so we can have a picture in the mind. And just as there are two, two I mean, that whole thing is just a system. We're about to pull in, and some crazy just cuts Natalie off because that lane was shorter. I mean, literally, like, could have hit us. I'm mad. I mean, if I'm driving, I'm laying on the horn for a minute. Like, yeah, you, you feel that. Like, you hear that? That's what you deserve. And I'm just, I'm boiling. And now he's just sitting there. Oh, that wasn't nice. And I'm like, oh, maybe she should drive all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden, our lane starts going quicker. And I'm like, sucker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Lord knew. <laughs> no. That's not the point of the story. <laughs> so we go by. I wanted to look, you know, just like, yeah, but I didn't look. <laughs> just kept my, I was mature, kept my face forward. And, uh, and then a nice girl takes our order. And she, she looks at us and she's like, are, are you the pastor at the Grove? And I was like, I am. So glad I wasn't driving. <laughs> and she's like, I just started going to the church uh, like, like a month ago. Oh, I love the church. And oh, I'm so glad you're in our lane. And, and she was just, just really sweet. Name, name was Abby. And she was freezing. Like her, her, her teeth were chattering. And we're like, hey, you look really cold. Can we give you like a cup of coffee? She's like, you're offering me coffee? I'll like, give you a coffee. She's like, actually, could you? I'm like, yeah, we'll give you coffee. So we end up getting her coffee and, and we give it to her. And she comes up, she she comes up, met her on the other side of the restaurant. She's like, I just got to, she has, I have to tell you, this is the best part of my day. This was the best part of my day. So even in that moment, I'm like, oh, it's kind of nice we got cut off. <laughs> Did we get cut off for a reason? Just to meet Abby. I mean, I've been coming for, for, for a month. One of the first people I see on Sunday morning, Abby and her family. She comes up, that was, thank you so much for that coffee. That was so cool we bumped into you. It, just, it was just a simple reminder that God's involved in the details. You can think something's not working out. You could get frustrated, but maybe, maybe you got cut off for a reason. Maybe something happened for a reason. God is involved in the big details of your life and the smallest details of your life for a purpose. I have another example, but we got to keep going. Don't be mad when God changes your plan, but be open to what he's doing. Many times it's just an answer. It's an answer for you. God will show you what he wants. The question is, will you joyfully obey? Look at, look at Acts 16, 8 through 10 again. Acts 16, 8 through 10. It says, so passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to him. Point number three in your notes, when God brings clarity, and he will, immediately obey. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, but, but here's the thing. God brings clarity. Tom, I'm talking about you a lot, but there's things that you say that has affected my life. We don't have a God of confusion. We have a God of clarity. He brings clarity. He'll show you what to do. Will you immediately obey? God brings clarity in my life, not from visions. I got the word of God right in front of me. His word brings me clarity, he, he brings me clarity from closing doors, making something not happen. He brings clarity from opening doors. He brings the biggest, clearest times in my life is when I fasted. When I fasted, God answers. I'm not fasting to get what I want. I'm fasting to see what he wants. That's another sermon. Fasting's come, I mean, uh, clarity's come from mentors, people speaking truth into my life. I could go on and on and on. But here's the thing, God brings clarity. And even in this vision of the Macedonian man, it's not like, and this is everything of how the church is going to start. No, he gave, he gave Paul and his team enough to just go and see what happens. God gives you enough to take the next step. Will you immediately obey? But you're going to have to attempt, attempt to do things for the Lord. 
Expect the Lord to do great things. William Carey, Bible translator, pastor, missionary to India in the late 1700s, said, expect great things from God, attempt great things from God. But that will be filled with life of disappointment. It'll be filled with suffering. It'll take time. But we're making attempts, attempts, attempts with the hope to bring God glory. And the Lord will lead us as we go. He'll lead us as we go. Point number four on your notes. The ultimate plan of God is to see people come to Jesus. That's the ultimate plan of God. And I'm not going to read the passage right now, but if you continue to read verses 11 through 15, Paul makes his way down to the riverside. You remember that? Where he goes to Philippi, he sees some women, Lydia, there. He preaches and shares the gospel, and it says that her heart was open. God opened her heart and mind to hear, and the church started meeting in her home. This woman was ready to receive the Lord. God brought Paul and his team to the exact place where these ladies needed to be for this church to begin. That's how God moves. He's constantly moving us into positions to fulfill his plan, his purpose, and tell other people about Jesus. God is so good. So good. Now, there's so many things that I can't cover even in this. We're going to do something. We're going to try it this week called Five Minutes of Theology with Dr. Dan and Pastor Dan. Dr. Dan Wilson from CBU, and he's on our staff. He's just going to talk about some other theological aspects from the passage. We'll put that uh, online uh, in Instagram and Facebook. It'll just be five minutes, but we hope that you will enjoy. As we close and are about to take communion, ask yourself these questions and where God's leading you. What door has God closed that you need to go in the other direction? What has God clearly shown you that you need to immediately obey? How are you a part of seeing people come to Jesus? What goals do you have for that? As you think about this, like I said, and actually Jackson Harmio put this in my brain too during preaching prep, many times the things that God's calling us to are things that we're resisting. Not always, but many times. It's like, I don't know, I don't know. When you think about Jesus, I don't, wouldn't say Jesus resisted the cross, but you could tell he, he suffered eternally before walking down that road on the Garden of Gethsemane. So even as we take communion in a second, think about those things of like, Lord, I know this is what you want. I just haven't obeyed yet. And think about Jesus going to the cross and dying for the purpose of more people being saved. What are you resisting that you need to step forward, trusting in the Lord to do what he wants, to put yourself in a position to fulfill his purpose and maybe have someone else come to know Jesus around you? This is the second song from Walk Worthy that Kristen and his team wrote. They're going to start singing the first portion of it, Esther is, and then I'll lead us in communion. I don't know about you. I don't want what I want in this life. I I do. I know it's the Spirit's leading in me. I want what He wants. 
It just takes time figuring that out. Saying, Lord, show me what you want. Show me what you want. Lead me. Give me the strength to follow you, to take that next worthy step. Close doors, open doors. Evaluate my heart, but help me to have a a heart that's pure, that truly wants to live for your glory and not for me. Because the heart is deep waters. Sometimes in there is something selfish. Oh Lord, do I want what you want? Will I follow you where you lead me? Jesus shows us how. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul, he says this. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember his faithfulness to die for us. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim it together. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness and sacrifice. And may we be faithful to follow. Amen. Let's stand and sing the rest of this song together. God, you love me. God, you chose me.
It has been so wonderful worshiping with you tonight, church. Um, if anyone has any prayer, we're going to have team members up here who are willing to pray with you. If you are new to the Grove tonight, we'd love to see you over here at Guest Central. If you're interested in baptism as well, we're going to have a pastor right up here um, that you can speak with as well. Uh, feel free on the way out. We have giving boxes. And please also uh, take your offering little cup with you as well and throw that out as you go. Thank you all.